batteries. What survived the service? We had a pastoral and leaders meeting for a number of years we were holding Bible schools on Tuesday nights. Although we had a very good time, very few people turned up, so it was a, it was a great that we should do Bible school teaching in the church on Sunday. So as a break from tradition, we're not going to so much have a sermon today, but straight Bible school teaching. So we consider yourself now in Bible school, just sit down and relax. We're going to go through a lot of information, try and concentrate, and, and see if God can really open your mind onto what we're going to cover today. I've put together, yes, I've put together a PowerPoint presentation so you can go through with all this as we deal with it. So the Holy Bible and how it came to be. This is an actual fact, probably one of the greatest miracles of all things that God has ever done, is to give that Bible that you have in your lap or now on your e-device. But the fact that you've got it is actually one of the most massive miracles God ever did. Holy means consecrated, sacred, morally and spiritually perfect. And the Bible is an English word that comes from the Greek word biblos or biblion, which means the book. The name of the book is in the following references. In Psalm 40 verse 7 and Hebrews 10 7 it says, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will of God. So God is come in the volume of a book. Everything that we have, everything we believe, everything we choose, everything we stand for comes from that book. One Bible teacher came up with this acronym for Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. So when God has given, with anything, you get an instruction manual. So he's created his, us as his created beings. He didn't leave us alone. He's given us an instruction manual. And that's what this book is. The Bible we use today consists of 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament written by about 40 people got inspired. So in the Old Testament there are four sections, the Law, History, Poetry and Prophets. In the Gospels there are also four, in the New Testament there are four sections, the Gospels, Acts, Letters and Revelation. Of all the billions of works written, how do we know that this list of just 66 books is the sum total of God's inspired work for the people of earth? That's actually a very good question. How do we know that this is the Word of God, or the, the inspired words that God wanted to be given to us. So it really starts with Moses. So without doubt, God was with him, manifesting so many miracles in his life. Therefore, the Hebrews had no difficulty in accepting his five words, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy, as divinely inspired. And so too with his successor, Joshua. Moses set out the criteria for a person to be a true prophet of God. He's, and it says, If you say in your heart, how shall we know which word the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, this is the thing which the Lord has not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. So, although it's a negative way of actually getting to the positive thing, a prophet is someone who would say something would come to pass and it would come to pass and that prophet would also say to worship the living God. And so through the ages God's raised up prophets. In actual fact, only a few times did God speak directly and people didn't want to listen to them. So by the prophet the word came, by the prophet the word is established and by a prophet the word is to be finished. So the word came through the prophets. Thus, it came clear to the Hebrews those people God had inspired to record the words God wanted people to receive. As there was no printing in those days, the Hebrews knew that these words needed to be preserved, so they were painstakingly reproduced by people called scribes. So when you come across the New Testament people called scribes, they were the people that used to keep copying out, copying out, copying out the scriptures so that they would always be there for posterity. Each new copy had to be made from an approved manuscript written with a special kind of ink upon sheets made from the, clean, the skin of a clean animal. A clean animal is, is those that chew the cut and have cloven hooves. The writers had to pronounce each word before writing it, and on no account was any single word to be written from memory. 
The new copy was carefully examined with the original and if there was only one incorrect letter, the whole copy was rejected. In the Hebrew documents of the Old Testament, any variations introduced by the copyists amounted to less than one ten thousandth of the entire tick. So we can be fairly confident with the effort that the scribes went to to preserve the Word of God that it remained as the Word of God. They, they took this really seriously. So this, this, this can give us great confidence that the, the translations we have from the original Hebrew are right. Hallelujah. The Bible was originally written on long slip sheets of parchments and then rolled on wooden rollers. These were called manuscripts, which means written by hand. These manuscripts were expensive amount and took approximately a year's wages to produce. And the next slide just shows you that the, the, the Jews today still follow this biblical tradition of holding the scriptures in this manner. In Psalm 68 verse 11 it says, The Lord gave the word great was the company of those that published it. So, so the psalmist is actually giving praise to these people that have gone to the effort of, of writing these scriptures down for, for posterity. To conserve space, the Hebrew language was originally written entirely in consonants without any vowels and with no spacings to divide the words because, as I've explained, if it's a year's wages for these manuscripts, it's, it's, the, it's important to get the maximum amount of words in it in this very limited, expensive space. The name Jehovah was simply written YHVH. And unfortunately, because, because the Jews wouldn't pronounce this word, we're not even sure if Jehovah is a proper name of God, so they would never say it. So we don't know what the vowels in between were, and, and, and most people surmise it's Jehovah meaning it's ever-existing one. If we were to write the Lord's Prayer in this manner, it would appear thus. So. That's the way the translators had to try and make sense of what was written. So, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So, so the translators had to, to deal with, with, the, with the text written like that. No spaces, no commas, no explanation, nothing, just like that. However, this did cause some problems for translators, purely for genius in it. Oh yeah, no, it's God is no here, now here is God is nowhere. So that's... So he was a translator trying to work out what that says, and without the vowels in it, sometimes it can have two meanings. So this did cause, in this case it's clear, but for some translators in some areas it, it became difficult. So the, the next slide just shows you how meticulously beautiful the Hebrews were in writing the letter. It's, it's the, they were absolute artisans in, and the clarity with which they wrote it. And that's the effort they went to to make sure that it was clear, Beautifully, you'd think that was printed, but it's actually been written with a pen. So they're a real calligrapher. So that's that's the clarity of, of the Hebrew that, that they wrote out and the effort they went to to do it. The Old Testament books, as we know it, was compiled by the Jews after they were taken captive in Babylon, and so they knew they had the scrolls and they kept them in the temple. If you go through the Old Testament and you see there was several revivals that, because the, they fell in sin and then they'd go and find copies of them the law and read it to the kings and the kings would repent and then go back but the, the scrolls really, really weren't kept in any proper decent order and so when they were taken captive to Babylon they took all their scrolls with them then they realised how important it was and they set to and set the whole the whole canon or the whole divine work in order after their return from the Holy Land they were conquered by the Greeks who forced the, their culture upon them and many of the Jews could no longer speak Hebrew because of this, in about 277 BC, 70 scholars in Alexandria, Egypt, began a translation of the Old Testament Hebrew into Greek, known as the Septuagint, which is a Latin word meaning 70. The Septuagint was widely circulated and was used as a basis for many future translations. And this is the first time that the Bible was, as the Old Testament, was translated into the language of the common people of those days. So when Alexander conquered the people, he didn't just conquer militaristically, he also conquered with culture, and they believed their culture was so superior to everybody else, they imposed Hellenism upon them and made them learn the Greek culture. And, and the Jews were, were no exception to receiving a dose of this. And so therefore, because of this, the scriptures were then available. When you read in Acts chapter 7, I think, when they had arguments between the, the Hellenists or the Greek Jews and the, and the Hebrew Jews that about distribution of the 
way the church should be organised. The Hebrew-speaking Jews felt they were more superior to the Greek-speaking Jews, but unfortunately um, we shouldn't be like this. But this is how that happened back then. It was said that he was in the Septuagint that the present familiar titles by which the various books of the Bible are known were first adopted, and the order in which they were arranged have been followed ever since, although it was quite different from the original Hebrew Scriptures. And the main reason why they were set up like that is purely how much could fit on the scroll. So one prophet would fit on, on, on one scroll and the so-called minor prophets would all be written on a separate scroll. So it was purely set up for the way they could sit on adding scrolls, not, not the word order in which they were written or for any other reason. As the bulk of the Gentile church was Greek speaking, the Septuagint was readily adopted as the Old Testament. However, it took about 400 years after the death of Christ for the Bible to be finally agreed on the 27 books to, that form the New Testament as we know it today. So, it's interesting, this occurred in the Council of Trent in 397 AD, and this following test was applied. Did it come as thus saith the Lord? Did they recognise God's voice in it? Did it have a life-transforming power of God when it was applied? Was the author an apostle or connected to an apostle? So, for example, Mark was with Peter and Luke was with Paul. Was it accepted as received by other apostles who were eyewitnesses, such as Peter stated that the scriptures were written by Paul in 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16? Was it accepted by the overall church? And most of these, these, these books were already being fairly well accepted. They were just finally rattled rat making sure which which text they were going to have because there was a few extraneous texts that were coming in they wanted to make sure they didn't come. Did the people bear witness by, of it by the Holy Spirit? Did it conflict with the already revealed body of scripture? Did the books have the quality of inspiration that was consistent with the word of God? And so going through these 27 books, it's quite clear the, the, the only other two authors, Jude and James, were half-brothers of Jesus, so naturally they qualified as well, although they were not apostles or not the original twelve. As Christianity spread, the need arose for translations of the Holy Scripture into various languages. Syriac was one of the first translations about AD 200. The Vulgate was translated into Latin about the middle of the second century AD. Armenian and Gothic translations were made around 300 to 400 AD. An Ethiopic translation was made in, four, in 600 AD. For a thousand years, the Vulgate was a standard Bible of the Catholic Church. The common people could not read Latin. Also, the interpretation of scriptures was the sole role of the clergy. During the Dark Ages, God's word was locked up in Europe in Latin language. So one of the turning points of this, that means basically for, for 1260 years, no one could get access to scripture except for what, whatever the priests taught them. So therefore no one had really, no one could really get the Bible and, and read it for themselves. So one of the turning points to all this was the 300 years of Crusades. The Crusaders learned new languages. They had the opportunity to see African Christianity and read scriptures and get copies of, of them in Hebrew and Greek. They learned from the Muslims, who at that time were highly technically advanced. The Muslims had the science and had the technology, whereas, whereas the Dark Ages Europe was really backward. I don't want to read all of this on the invention of paper in the next slide, but that was actually, there's a few landmarks in, in, that in the point in time, sometimes these technological advances can, can really change the whole face of civilization. So paper was invented by the Chinese in AD 105, but the Muslims took it and were starting to make it in Spain. But it was the, it was the beginning of the printing revolution of the 15th century. The next one, perhaps the greatest invention of the millennium was that by a German blacksmith named John Gutenberg of the movable type printing press. And there's, there's, the, there's the first printing press. And because he was a blacksmith, he was a metallurgist, and he realised if he could put letters, the single blocks, he could keep moving the letters around to make print. And that was probably the, one of the greatest inventions ever. It changed the world as we know it. Just this, it may be just a simple thing like this. So no longer people had to spend hours and hours writing the scriptures out by hand. It was fitting that the first book to be printed was the Bible. And here's a picture of Gutenberg with his, with his first Bible printed up. It was printed in Latin, but it still was fitting that it was the first Bible printed, first book ever printed. 
Unfortunately, despite the great advance of this new, new technology, there was great opposition to the printing and distribution of Bible. The medieval church destroyed as many copies as they could find and killed both the translators and the printers. So in England alone in 1553, Queen Mary came to the throne. She decreed the printing, imputation and circulation of Bibles were prohibited. During her reign, over 300 years, 300 Bible-loving men were burnt at the stake. And, and so here we have a picture, and the next picture shows the... Yes, so this was common not just throughout England but throughout Europe. So Bibles were taken and burnt and taken and burnt and taken and burnt. So God wanted his word preserved but, but, but there was a really strong push to stop people getting scriptures and reading for themselves. So it's a real miracle you've got your Bible. And, and the effort these people went to at the, at the threat of death, they were still translating and printing Bibles. And even though they were murdered, they still kept going. <coughs> the Protestant Queen... Elizabeth I succeeded Queen Mary. An important, important, an important Bible was published and given to her, both of which was the Geneva Bible. And people like Tyndall, which, of, which is a big story, had a lot to do. They fled to Switzerland and, and with the new printing presses printed Bibles. It was smaller in size and became popular. It was a Bible that was brought to America by the pilgrims. It was a very important Bible for the following reasons. It used small more easily read Roman type. It was the first Bible to be divided into verses, which makes a huge difference in, in the way we, we no one understand it. And the person that invented putting the Bible in verses was, was martyred. So, so people had given their blood for us to get these. And it was the first use of italic for the words that the translator added for the sake of the English idiom, and which were not in the original text. So that, that all, all makes the, the understanding of what we've got clearer. It was the first to admit the apocryphal books since their introduction into the Septuagint. I don't want to go into the apocrypha in particular, but they're the books. You can get a copy of it, but the, uh, but the apocrypha is not acknowledged by Orthodox Jews or the Protestant Church as being inspired, but they're the works of people who are known as the apocrypha. In 1611 AD appeared the King James Version. This is the translation known used by most English-speaking people. It, it, was held, it held first place for 400 years. 47 translators were divided into groups into which were given a certain section of the Bible to translate. Ancient Hebrew texts were studied in order to obtain the best results together with all the known translations, especially the Ethiopic and Syrian. And what they found is that there were some, there were many, many, many copies, particularly of the New Testament. Some of them didn't quite agree with each other. The, the Old Testament was, was very, very accurate, so they didn't worry about that so much. But they found an Ethiopic translation and a Syriac translation that were much older than the Greek text that they had, and they found the two matched, and they felt, well, they must have been translated from the original, so they used that as a standard by which we get a, a New Testament today. The Tyndall's translation, who was one of the first to translate from the Hebrew and Greek, was so good that 80% of it was adopted for the King James Version. The metre of the Hebrew is also adopted in this translation. And I don't know if you've ever seen films of, of Jews praying, but they, they pray like this. And what happens is the, the Hebrew language has got metre like a poem. And what they do to help them remember it, they, they move their bodies back and forward in, into the metre of the language. And so, the, the King James translator even wanted to try and get that aspect of the of the scriptures into into translation. Despite all the efforts to make the translations easier to read, sorry, uh, those terrible these and thous were deliberately put into the by the translators, even though they were not part of the spoken English at that time, for the following reason. They accurately translate the second person so clear in both Hebrew and Greek, but are missing in modern English. Without them, the thrust of the translation is lost. The argument that they were putting to make the Bible sound old, or, or sound ancient, is spurious. So if you wonder why they did it, if you're, most of you are, are second language speakers, you're aware in your language, other than English, there's a second person. Well, that, that's the V and the thou as the first, second and third person to try and make the translation more accurate, not to make it more difficult to understand, unfortunately. Despite all the efforts to make translations easy to read, many more modern translations have been 
attempted. A large number of these have fallen into the trap of interpreting rather than translating. It means that many, as many versions as you, you can read as many versions as you like, but use the King James Version as your reference point, and if you're really serious, learn Hebrew and ancient Greek. So the next, this one just shows us how we got our Bible. So it goes into the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were much more ancient, and they found that they matched up with scriptures. There was a Septuagint, which I mentioned, the Bible was also written on, on paper with papyrus, which was making, which was an early form of paper invented by the Egyptians, which was a lot rougher, not nowhere near as good as paper. And then there was the Syriac version, and the Latin version, and the Vulgate versions, and then there was the Masoretic version, which was the very accurate Jewish version, and there was Wycliffe, who was one, one of the first translators in English, and then we've got Tyndall, who, but he translated that from the Latin, whereas Tyndall translated from the Hebrew and Greek. And what he did is he recognised there were 630 words in the original Hebrew, so he only used 630 words in the, he in the English translation. So if you, think, if you think the vocabulary is big, it's more powerful just by the way he used so few. And then there was Coverdale and King James and then the Jewe version, which was put out by the Catholics in opposition to the King James and then all the translations as we see them today. And another mighty angel had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. This is a prophecy of the invention of the printing press and the global distribution of the Bible, where the sneeze was no longer a barrier. So this, this was the turning point, and if you understand the point, it's in Revelation 10, which follows Revelation chapter 9, surprisingly. Revelation chapter 9 is the rise of Islam, and so after the rise of Islam, as we discussed, which the Crusades, came the printing press, and then the, and then the printing of the Bible. So no more did they have to have these great bulky leather manuscripts anymore written by hand, a little book open for all us to read the Bible. The great company of Psalm 68 verse 11 was started by the Hebrew scribes, as we saw, were dedicated to accurately reproducing the scripture. Tradition was passed down to the first church to a number of the scribes who had converted to Christ. So again, they, they reproduced the Greek in exactly the same way as they had learned to reproduce the Hebrew. Up until the invention of the printing press, all copies of scripture had to be methodically copied out by hand, which severely limited the number of copies available. Nevertheless, it was done and they were still available. So, so to the handwriting scribes, we, we owe a great debt. The British Final Bible Society was founded in March 1804 to encourage a wider circulation and use with the aim of supplying Bibles and New Testament scriptures without notes or comments on a worldwide basis in a language people could understand at a price they could afford. In the first year there were some 67 languages into which at least one of the Bible had, books of the Bible had been translated. Now around 200 years later there is 146 Bible societies who publish Bibles in over 2,000 languages and the translation work still continues. So most of the Bibles that, that, most of the translations that were made by missionaries were made from the King James and many of the versions you will read or the translation you will have been, will have been translated from the King James rather than from the Hebrew and Greek. But nevertheless, people just want to make sure that, that the Bible is available to every person upon the planet and these societies we had to take our hat off to the dedication they go to to make sure. And at many times they do it, even to this day they get martyred for doing this. So, so don't think that it's just stopped through the dark ages, there's many martyrs in modern time trying to, to promulgate the word. If you, start, if you try this in Saudi Arabia you'll find you'll be dead fairly quickly. So there are even countries now where you can't distribute and preach and teach freely. The Bible is copyrighted by God. So, so this is how we got it. And so, what does the Bible say about itself? And so now we'll just have a little look. We, we're convinced, or hopefully by reading this, we can understand this is the words God wants us to have, and this is, this is what the Bible says about itself. The Bible is copyrighted by God. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish anything from it, that you may keep my commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. The thing which I command you, observe to do these, you shall no part thereof, nor diminish from it. 
and they're not into his words, lest you reprove me, and they'll be found alive. So you're not allowed to take away from the word, and you're not allowed to add to the word. In Revelation, it says the same thing in 22.18. For I testify unto every man that he is the words of the prophecy of the book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the prophet, this book of prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life out of the holy city and from the things which are written in the book. So the modern translators don't fully realise how important some of these things are. And there's a group of people in America called the KJVOs or King James Version only. But some of these modern translators um, produce some of these really peculiar translations and they go to defend themselves on television, God smites them dumb. And so it's 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 a You've got to be very careful how you play with the Word of God. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, as we discussed, except for half of Daniel and Esther, which was, and all of Esther, which were written in Chaldee. The New Testament was written in Greek. God inspired about 40 people to write it down, but the work is one author. And that's something you've got to really fully appreciate. Although a number of people were used to write it down, it's the work of one author, and that is the Holy Spirit. Some say that they do not know what the word, what God's will is. The titles Old Testament, New Testament, are abbreviations for Will and Testament. So this is this is God's will. The Old Testament was written in the blood of animals, and the New Testament is written in the blood of Jesus Christ. And by keep reading it, God's will for your life will emerge. Understandably, there's been some strange ideas concerning the Bible. It is often called the Word of God. The Bible contains the Word of God, but we don't know which parts they are. Technically, calling the Bible the Word of God misrepresents it because many of the words in the Bible are not God's words. The other idea is that it contains a mixture of God's Word and a philosophy of others, and we do not know which is which. This is pernicious teaching. It puts great doubt in the minds of the reader. So what we have to get clear is all Scripture was given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The scriptures were given to people by inspiration. Every word in the Bible is God-inspired. So, so you have to understand it's not necessarily God's word, but it's the word God-inspired to be written down. There is nothing more important in our walk with God than the words in the Holy Bible. Heaven and hell shall pass away but my words shall not pass away. God inspired people to quote from archangels, angels, prophets, priests, kings, people of authority, common people, from demons, and even from a Shias in Numbers 22, 28 to 30, who speaks three lines. Then the great assassin of them all, the devil. It does not require great interpretive skill to determine which words came from God and which Words come uh, quotes from others. The Bible is a dialogue between God and his creation, and that's what you'd expect. And that's why there are words in there that God is dialoguing with. So why why is it strange that there's devil's words in there? It's just with God's word, because he's trying to teach us about dialogue. So, so some people just make the Bible so complicated when it doesn't need to be. When it's God's word, it is God's word. When it's a quote, it's a quote. It doesn't need to be complicated. There are just so many people that are experts that want to complicate it. There's another one is the prophetic parts of the Bible are so hard to interpret, it's best not to teach Bible prophecy. Well, a third of the Bible is, about 24% of the Bible is, is prophecy, so if you're doing that, you throw out a quarter of the Bible. Second Peter 1 19 says, We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well to take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not of old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Just because something is difficult does not remove our obligation from studying it. Amen. Another one is that the letters of Paul to heresy this statement was made by churchmen who kept the scriptures from the people during the Dark Ages and developed their own doctrines and teaching. It was Paul's letters that exposed their teaching as heresy. So many of these ideas are cited by 
people who don't really want to study the Bible too thoroughly. You can go through the next, is a fairly long way of showing you that if you read 85 verses a day, you'll read the whole Bible in a year. That's about three and a quarter chapters. It's in, in the next slide. It's easy to let things distract us from reading the Bible. So how common is this? The Spirit anointed people to draw on a wide variety of literary devices in the Bible. We don't have time to go through all these, but understand that, that, that the Bible is actually a lot of different things. It's narrative history, it's geology, comedies, proverbs, prayers, apocalypse, sermons, parallelism, all these different things. And God did this because we, he knows we're all of, of different idea, of different taste, of dis different understanding, of different intellectual ability. So he's adopted all these different ways of trying to communicate so that there's something there for you, so you can understand it. And, and by understanding that the Bible is written like this in all these different literary uses all these literary devices, then, uh, then you say, what am I reading? Is this a type? Is this an anti-type? Is it a parable? Is it a proverb? Is it a prayer? Is it? And if you understand, if you try and work out what you're reading, it actually makes more sense what it's trying to speak to you about. And so uh, being aware of this, and, and uh, uh, it takes a lot of Bible teaching to understand how to interpret the Bible, but at least if you're aware that the Bible has got so many different literary ways of describing things, but again, it's, it's each one will apply to us differently and God understands the whole gamut of the human human feeling and desire and understanding. So he's, he's put it this way so that we can all, all get some idea of some part of it that particularly applies to us. Read it, love it, live it, apply it, medita meditate upon it day and night, integrate it into your prayer life, share it with unbelievers and share it with believers. So this is what our responsibility is, to do with it. Luke 4, 4 it says, And Jesus answered him, saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word of God. And, and in the Jewish only version from which Jesus quoted, does man live? We don't live by bread alone, we also live by every word of God. Deuteronomy 6 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. So we know this so well, but following it says, And these words which I command you this day, shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently unto your children. You shall talk of them when you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand. They shall be frontlets between their eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on, your, on thy gates. And sometimes many Christians put up Bible verses in, in, in frames on their, on their walls. And that's exactly what we should be doing. And the verses of the Bible, I, I forever keep on sticking magnet verses of the Bible on, the, on my refrigerator just so that we're forever putting the, the word before our eyes and before our, before our minds. In the next, next picture you've probably seen Orthodox Jews and that's exactly what they're doing. They bind the scriptures on their arm and put them in boxes on, on their heads and the front was before their eyes so that they read this verse and try, and try and obey it literally but really I think that God's intending that we get it in our heart rather than do it do it by an order of, of trying to obey, obey the scripture so literally. So if you didn't understand when you saw Jews looking like that, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to obey that, that verse of the Bible. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So this is something, if you want to be approved of God, unfortunately we can pray and we do all these things and that's important, but we have to study. We have to study. For in, in Jeremiah 23 verse 17, For who hath stood in the council of the Lord? Who hath preserved his word? <coughs> perceived his word and heard his word and marked his word and heard it. So there's no, some people say you shouldn't mark a Bible. The Bible tells you to mark it. So if you see something important in your Bible, mark it. So that's something that God wants you to do. Some people feel, oh it's a holy book, I can't mark it. But but the Bible wants you to read it. And if there's something that really appeals to you, mark it. Get your highlighter, your coloured pencil, whatever you do. Mark it. That's, that's what the Bible wants you to do. When you come back, there it is. Mark for you to, to remind you of that special thing that God touched you with. And Isaiah 28, <coughs> verse 10. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And this is exactly how we got our word. First 
There was Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Josh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, so on, first, first, second Samuel. And all these things slowly, 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 slowly came. So that the word came to us slowly, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And this is actually an amazing prophecy here. It says, For we strongly with well, another tongue will he speak unto his people. To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. So the word of God came to the point of the Pentecostal experience, and this is what this is prophesying. So the word, that's the zenith point for which the, the scriptures were pointing towards was the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the elements of speaking in tongues. But the word of the Lord unto them that didn't get filled with the Holy Spirit was precept upon precept, precept upon spirit, precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they may go and fall backwards and be broken and slain and taken. So, <clears throat> so they had the Bible, they saw the people speaking in tongues, they said, the only people are drunk, what's this, 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 this? And, and even through the dark ages, and up until I was filled with the Holy Ghost in the, in the 60s, they used to say, tongues is the devil, this, this, this. The, the churches wouldn't accept it. And so if you don't accept this is the point to which the, the Word is bringing you, then the word will end up destroying you if you don't understand where it's trying to take you. So that's the point to which it's taking people. And if you don't understand, then you'll end up being broken. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men, that all the earth which are in Jerusalem. So the word is telling them to really hear this. I remember I was in this Pentecostal organisation and they decided to have a world conference in Jerusalem. And they got all the elders of the Jewish church to meet them in, in this spirit of ecumenicalism that's in the world today. <clears throat> and they said, what's all this Pentecostalism you're talking about? And, and they turned to Isaiah 28 and showed them these verses. This is what we believe in. And all these people that have been taught to memorise Genesis to Malachi had never seen that verse. Never seen it. So it's amazing how their eyes can be darkened to the most important aspects of Scripture. In Psalm 138 verse 2, one of, again, one of these very, very important verses in the Bible. I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and for your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. If you don't fully understand what this means, um, in the next slide, there's a high esteem that God puts upon his own word. In, in Australia, individuals and business stands or fall on the reputation or name. When a business is sold in Australia, part of that business will have goodwill. That is a monetary value placed on the reputation or name of that business having establishing itself. So, so in this case here, the name. So if you say, remember that advertisement where um, somebody said, what do you do? And I said, I work in a bank and the party went dead because banking, bankers had a bad reputation or car salesmen or, or whatever. So, so a company's name is very, very important and God actually puts his word above his name, his reputation. If God said he does it, it's more important than his actual name. At the name, of every, at the name of Jesus, every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow. And note that everybody shall do that to the name of Jesus, but God puts his word above his name. So the word is actually above his name. So every time you read the word Jesus or God or whatever you read, above that God has put his word. It's above his name. His reputation is so important to himself because God is not a man that he should lie. And finally, we read in, in John 10, 35b that the scripture cannot be broken. So, so those 66 books that you've got in your lap or on your e-device is God's inspired work that he wants us to have and it cannot be broken. Be sure that what you've got is what God wants you to have and then enact your life upon it. Amen. Have a Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, hallelujah. Lord, sometimes we preach, sometimes we teach, sometimes we do all these things, Lord, but you've called your servants, Lord, to, to feed the flock, Lord, glory to God, hallelujah. Lord, let these words translate into understanding the importance of your word and how to live it and love it, Lord, glory to God. We thank you, Lord, that you made it so easy for, for us to obtain that whereas once it was hidden but now it's available to us all. Come us and guide us now. Bless us with your power and spirit. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Amen.